discouraged and just feel like nothing is coming together, nothing is working right. But then he says, I called to God and I sought Him. I call to God and I seek Him. That is a description of intense prayer. When we're feeling down and discouraged and depressed and distraught and all these things, it's time to get on your knees and pray and seek the Lord. And the truth is, many of us fail right here. When trouble comes, instead of calling on God, some call it quits. Some complain. Others compromise or criticize or compare rather than calling on God when the day of trouble comes. Verses 7 through 9, uh, I, I kind of put my own little title on it. When heaven seems like brass. Have you ever had times when you feel like you're crying out to God, but where's God? I don't feel like He's even hearing my prayers. When heaven seems like brass, you know, you feel like you're being rejected, you're a failure, uh, God is angry at you, you're being judged, He's, he's disapproving of you, you feel like you've lost His favor, uh, His promises have failed, His mercy and His compassion, where's all that at? And I, I love that the Psalms are just so raw and honest. Sometimes we feel like that. Where is God? Where are these promises that He, he gave us? What, I don't understand. Sometimes we feel like that. And yet we need to remember. And there's a song we sing from time to time. It says, Your love never fails. It never gives up. Never runs out on me. On and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never, ever have to be afraid. One thing remains. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. When we're in the darkness of despair, we need to remember that God never fails. Now, our church has had some mighty moves of God, and there's even been some prophetic words that our church would continue to grow, and there would be revival flowing in and through and beyond this church, and that there would be healings and refreshings. And we've seen some of that, and yet, in my heart, I, I feel like there's still more. And, and sometimes, if I'm totally honest, I can wonder, God, what happened to those promises? Where's, where's the continued growth? Where's the healing? Where's, where's the revival? But then we come to the dawn of decision. Verses 10 through 12, he says, I will remember the miracles. I will meditate and consider. That is, uh, that meditating and consider is to kind of mutter over and over, and it's to ponder and imagine and even declare something. He says, I will remember his deeds and his miracles, his work and His mighty deeds. I will remember these things. Can you remember some of God's miracles? There are some good ones in the Bible. The crossing of the Red Sea. How amazing was that? Manna from heaven to feed millions of people every day. Conquering of Jericho by marching around the city and blaring some trumpets on the last day. Jesus fed 5,000 people. He healed leper, lepers and, and uh, paralytics. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. Those are all biblical things that God has done. And the Scripture says God never changes. But He can do those things again today. Now, let me bring it a little closer to home, though. Some things that we can remember that God has done even in the past decade. Let me read a few of these. One wrote, I was working out on Monday and I had soreness in my left leg as I was lifting it and was trying to do step aerobics but was experiencing a sharp pain. So I resorted to doing the exercise on the ground rather than using the step. Again, on Tuesday, I started out and it returned. So I said to the Lord, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't have anything hindering me from working out. So I laid my hand on my leg where it hurt and asked God to heal me. He touched it immediately. 
and I have been able to work out with no pain and haven't been bothered since. Thank you, Lord. That was awesome. My thinking was, I just need to ask, and how many times do I just deal with stuff and don't simply ask the Lord to intervene? Here's another one. Uh, some friends that many of you know said we had taken quite a drop in our financial support this year. And our one-time gifts last year never continued into the second year. We told our kids we didn't have enough money to buy the new shoes for the school year, and they would have to wear their old ratty tatties. The cash we had left was only for groceries. But a week before school, a guy at church walked up to me, unaware of what was going on, and handed me this envelope with a strange look on his face. He said, use this for your kids to get what they need for school. God is good and faithful. It was enough money to get the kids new shoes for school. Here's another one. During the month of July, this is back in 2005, I asked for prayer concerning my finances at both uh, care groups I was attending. And between August 1 and 17, I received approximately $1,400 in unexpected income. Here's another one. Are you getting encouraged yet? Uh, we'll remember. Our son got sick. He was saying his side hurt, and he was complaining that he was tired. So he took a nap, and when I went to wake him, he was extremely hot to touch. We took his temperature, and it was 105. We rushed him to the hospital, and they did a blood test and a CAT scan, and came to find out that he had a blood poisoning in his lymph nodes. They kept him in the hospital overnight, and he was better the next day. But then we got a phone call the next week to come in and visit with the doctor about some of the test results. The doctor told us that there was an abnormality in the CAT scan that looked like lymphoma. They said they would have to wait for two months and do another test because they wanted to see if the lymph nodes changed or stayed the same. A couple months later, we went back to the hospital for another CAT scan and were told that there was still an abnormal mo node in his abdomen. The doctor in Boone was really concerned that this could be cancer and made us an appointment uh, to take him to an oncologist in Des Moines. The next day, I went to pass and prayed with him. I called on family and friends, and we prayed. On Sunday morning, several people prayed with him and anointed him with oil. The oncologist in Des Moines gave us a lot of hope and told us that they thought it was a shadow from the burial. He said they would still do one more test, test just to check from another view. That Friday, we went back to Des Moines. They did a PIT scan, or PET scan, or whatever that is. The doctors viewed the results from this scan and could not find anything. He's very healthy, and there's nothing wrong with him. Praise the Lord. The Des Moines doctors were telling us that the Boone doctors misread the test. I believe that it was the power of prayer. Okay, now, here's another one you might figure out who this one is. Our son was playing backyard baseball with the neighborhood kids. A foul tip off the bat unexpectedly hit him directly in the left eye. After realizing that he had no vision in that eye, we took him to the ER. He was sent to an ophthalmologist in Fort Dodge that same night. And the doctor said his injury was severe and he would need to be on complete bed rest and be seen daily. We saw that same doctor, doctor the next three mornings and then were transferred to a doctor in Ames for the fourth day. That doctor also concluded that this was a severe injury and he would need to be seen by a retinal specialist in West Des Moines. After two weeks, his vision was 2,400 due to bleeding in the back of his eye where there were many breaks in the retina. The doctor in West Des Moines said that his vision would never return to normal but it would get better and could be corrected with lenses. He stressed over and over again how this injury was a serious trauma to his eye. We saw that doctor bi-weekly and then monthly, and after three months, our son's vision was 20-25. The doctor said he was shocked and surprised at how his vision had returned to near normal. He sent an eye chart home with us to use daily to monitor any changes in his vision. At the last use, he had 20-20 vision in that eye. We asked for prayer immediately following the injury and received much feedback from people who prayed throughout the whole ordeal. We know God is responsible for this miracle. 
I will remember. One more. I think it's just one more. Let me see. Okay. It's kind of long. It's a good one, though. Ready? Got a backup. For the last six to seven months, I've been experiencing horrible pain in my shoulder. The therapist told me that I had tendonitis in my shoulder, that my shoulder was lodged forward and had been for a long time. At that time, I didn't really know what to say. I prayed about it, and I told some friends about it, and they tried to comfort me, but it didn't really help much. As the three months went by, my shoulder got a little better, and I was almost fully healed. Football had just finished as well, so my shoulder was increasing in strength rather quickly. My therapist said I could start lifting weights again. But then I overdid it one day, and both of my shoulders popped, and it was everything I could do to lift my arms. I went home that night and cried because it hurt so much. This is a young man crying because it hurt so much. I prayed and prayed for God to heal me. Well, this last weekend, when I was at church, afterwards, at Pastor Phil said that we were going to have a time of prayer up at the altar, and I felt God saying, go up there already. Just ask for help. So I did. Now, two days later, my shoulders are in perfect shape. I have no pain, no limited motion, nothing. I mean, like after spending hours of therapy and doing exercises, I was perfect. Now, you can't tell me that that doesn't have God written all over it. It just goes to show how nothing is impossible if you give it to God. I will remember. And, and, and there are more. Those are just a few examples. Some of you may recall when we were adding on this addition to the church, that about the time we decided we're definitely moving forward with this, we found out that the church was in a will that would help us make the initial down payment. And then, just as we were kind of winding down the building, we realized that we hadn't really factored in uh, some costs for new sound equipment that we would need for a little bit bigger facility. And just before we were wrapping all up, somebody in the church came into some money and made a large, substantial donation, and we were able to do all of that. And there's history even way back that Something about a will back in the old days and some dogs or something. I can't remember the details, but God has provided over and over again. And many of you could probably think of other things that God has done. And we see God's hand at work. So that takes me to the day of deliverance. Verse 13, the writer here talks about the holy ways of God. His ways are holy and unique. His, his ways are on behalf of people, and He is personal. God cares about your situation. And what might seem like an impossibility to you is not an impossibility to God. We just heard some. Hopefully you're encouraged by some of the reports that I shared, and those were local. They're people you know. Here's another one in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. It says that King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. As a result, there's a great famine in the city, and the siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver, and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. Now, Elisha was the prophet of God, and he said, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. It, I, I can't, no, just knowing the story, I'm thinking Elijah really had some brass. I mean, because here's what he says. They've been under siege all this time. They're starving. Prices have gone through the roof because they're running out of everything. And Elisha comes on the scene with a word from the Lord. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, five quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver. And ten quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. Yeah, right. And that was the reaction. In fact, the officer who was assisting the king said, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But guess what? It happened. 
God caused fear to come into the camp of the Arameans, and they left all of their supplies out there in the open field. And the people that were under siege now had all of these supplies just freely at their disposal. Overnight. And so often we get in a situation and we can't see how God, how anything, not even God, could turn this situation around. And yet, God can do it. We need to remember. He says, you know, we need to understand that He has not forgotten you. Church, He has not forgotten us. He is great. He is miraculous. He is powerful. He is redeeming. Verse 15, He talks about how we are the redeemed people. Aren't you glad that God intervened and saved you? then He can still intervene in your life today. Yes, He can. Verses 16 through 20 describes what I call the great escape. Uh, uh, kind of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, basically. It's a strong illustration of God's power and what God can do. And everything in this passage is about there is a hope for the future. So, has God rejected us? No. No, He's faithful to His Word. Will He never again show His favor? No, He will not show His favor again. His love is unfailing. When it feels like God doesn't care anymore, we need to remember His love is unfailing. His promises have not failed. He hasn't forgotten how to be gracious to us. He's not so angry that He's no longer compassionate. No. He is still all of these things. Yes, He is. When we look at our circumstances, we focus on ourselves and we can see no hope. Because we're looking an inch in front of ourselves. And it feels like there's nowhere to go. Now, Asaph is the writer here. He didn't completely solve all of his problems. But he did move out of the shadows of doubt into the sunshine of communion with the Lord and confidence in God was his story. First, he looked up by faith and rejoiced in the greatness of God. Then he looked back with thankfulness to the miracles of Israel's exodus from Egypt. And finally, Asaph looked forward with hope because he remembered who God was. He is the shepherd of His people. And as believers, we can look back to Calvary where the Lamb of God gave His life for us. And if God did not spare His only Son for us, will He not also take care of us now? There's a wonderful picture for the people of God. And I want to say, God is not done with us yet. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you might be going through, God is not done yet. We need to remember who God is. We need to remember what God can do. And let's trust God for the days ahead. Amen? Let's not wallow in despair and discouragement, but let's move forward with confidence that God is with us and God has not forgotten us. He will lead us into His plan. Amen? I hope you're encouraged today. I was as I read through the scripts and started putting together like, yes! I needed that encouragement. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's stand. God, we thank You for Your Word. And your promises therein. And we know that your promises never fail. The scripture says they are yes and amen, and they never, ever fail. So, Lord, though our circumstances may cause us to feel one way, discouraged and down, we know that you are ultimately in control. 
and we will put our hope in you. Help us, Lord, to remember the truth of your word, to remember your miracles and your provision, both in the Bible and the stories that are told there, but also in recent history from people right here that we know personally how you have intervened on their behalf and help us to be encouraged by these things and to trust you for a hopeful future. There are better days ahead and you are not done with us yet. God, we will follow you as you lead us. And we say to God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God's blessings on you. Have a great week and go with God.